Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We welcome you as you've come together to celebrate your faith on this drizzly morning. We're glad you're here. And uh, just a few things to mention to you. We had originally scheduled our bluegrass picking for today from 4 to 6, but because of the potential for rainy weather and, uh, and keeping the band uh, healthy, we don't want uh, the band the singers in the band to, to get uh, sick, uh, we thought we'd be better to postpone it. And it looks like there's a real good possibility we'll be able to postpone it till next Sunday. And as soon as I get a definite word, I'll be sending out Facebook and um, uh, emails <clears throat> so that you'll be able to know uh, when to come and enjoy. It's, it's just a good time to be together and to enjoy uh, uh, bluegrass music and, and hear Eva sing and, and, and to be together as a church family and bring our neighbors with us. So hope that uh, works out for us. I do want to mention to you also that the trustees will be meeting this Wednesday evening at uh, 6 and then church council will be meeting this Wednesday at 7. Um, and we had originally uh, thought about getting together with outreach and witness right after church today. I don't think we need to now. No, okay. Okay. Now, for the big important thing, uh, there's, there is a bulletin board in Linger Hall uh, that has a lot of postcards on it, and we're getting ready for the October uh, a spaghetti dinner that we always do for cross lines. And uh, we would like for you, if you would, to be able to uh, let us know how you would be able to support that meal because the more things that we have donated, uh, the more money we'll be able to, to give to uh, the parish house. So if you could take a look at that, uh, if you could take a look at that today as you leave and, and maybe find a way to, to pitch in and give us a helping hand on that. It's really good to see you today. It's uh, uh, my Sunday mornings uh, mark my week uh, to be able to be with you, to be with my family, to be able to, uh, to be together in prayer and song and in smiles and greeting one another. And most of all, to be, gath to be together, gathered in the name of the one who loves us the most, Jesus Christ. Let the worship begin. With those who are able, please stand as we join our voices together in singing today's choral call to worship, the first verse of Let All Things Now Living, as we stand and sing together.
please respond with a bold print in today's call to worship. Come near to the Lord. Open your hearts to God's loving mercy. Lord, come into our hearts this day. Lift your sorrows and joys to the Lord. Having received God's mercy, bring that love to others. Lord, hear the truest expressions of our hearts. Be with us as we reach out to others in compassion. Come, rest in the love and mercy of God. Feel your spirits filled with the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you for the measureless blessings that you pour into our lives. Bless us again that as we worship you, we are served and empowered as faithful blessings for our others in your name. Let us pray. Lord, who lifts us up, reside in our hearts today. Help us to listen closely for your word to us. Remind us that you are always with us, not only in these moments of worship and praise, but throughout all of our lives. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may go into your world ready to share and reflect your love through all our lives. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise is Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart, number 160, and the words are placed on the monitor for you. Thank you, and please be seated. The New Testament lesson for us this morning as we prepare ourselves for moments of confession comes to us from the epistle of the Philippians, verse 21 through verse 30. Paul writes, For to me, living by life or by death, oh, excuse me, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. 
I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Let's sing together the fourth verse of softly and tenderly, please. Because we do not always live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, we confess before God and one another our sins and shortcomings and repentance. Let us turn toward God's mercy and grace. God of abundant goodness, we confess that we want your grace for ourselves but often wish punishment or exclusion on others. We judge the efforts and motives of others while ignoring the faults of our own. Forgive us, we pray, when we let jealousy overtake us. Forgive us, we pray, when we are petty, even in the presence of your generosity. Forgive us, we pray, when we feel slighted by you, may we ask once again for your mercy. Will you help us to be more faithful toward one another? We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, by whose grace we are saved.
God extends to us mercy beyond our deserving, grace beyond our ability to earn it. God has granted us the privilege of believing in Christ, and so we will live as grateful and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. And our response is the fifth verse of Just As I Am Without One Plea. As the acolytes come forward, I want to tell you a little story. Um, a little embarrassed about this, but I need to tell you anyway. I, <laughs> when I was a little boy, every Sunday morning when we were getting ready to go to church, my dad would take out of his pocket a quarter. And that quarter was for me to put in the Sunday school offering. Well, the previous Friday, they announced at school that the school store would be open. And I was thinking, hmm, 25 cents would buy me two hot rods, a whole pocket full of fireballs, and some bubble gum. So I kept my quarter. I didn't put it in the offering that day. And so Monday afternoon when I got home from school, mom says, go take your school clothes off and put on your plate clothes. And when in my bedroom, I still had a hot rod left. It was a piece of candy about this long. It was cinnamon flavored and it was hot. Everybody wanted a hot rod. Fireballs, my goodness. So I laid all that stuff out on the bed and mom dropped by and said, here's your clean t-shirt. Where did all that candy come from? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> it's right, Sarah Jean. And I realized that I was in trouble. And I realized that the money that Dad had given me to get to Sunday school, even though it was a quarter, was very important. It was a part of my Christian education to give that quarter to learn how to give to God a portion of the blessings that God has given me. So today, we are given that opportunity to return to the Lord a portion of the blessings that the Lord has given us. You need to get that quarter out so you have a clear conscience when you get home. Let's have a prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, may your eyes be open to this house, a place where you have promised to set your name. Lord, remind us of the multitude of blessings that come our way day after day. May we share those blessings, oh, Lord, that others may hear the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and that grace saves us for all eternity. These blessings we ask, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together the doxology? <laughs>
gospel lesson for us today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52, and I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. They spent some time in Jericho as Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples and a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting alongside the road. When he heard that Jesus, the Nazarene, was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled all the louder, Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped in his tracks. Call him over. They called him. It's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, what can I do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus, your faith has saved and healed you. And in that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road. A word of God for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. Please be seated, and as we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I invite the kids to join me here for a little time. <laughs> sweetheart. I'm glad you're here. How's everybody doing? You sure do look good today. You look great. School going okay? Yeah? Wow. What are you in? PK? Pre-K. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Well, I've graduated, so. I want to tell you all a story. You've heard me talk about my good friend when I was your age, whose name was Jack Allen. Have you heard me talk about Jack Allen? Jack Allen was a year or two younger than I was, and he was a little guy. He was a little guy, but he had this giant heart. And I just love Jack Allen. We, we played together. I don't think we ever had a crossword or ever fought with each other, but we sure could get into some stuff. We like to ride bikes together, and we like to play in the woods together, the woods right across the road from my house. And so Jack Allen came up one Saturday, and we watched cartoons together. I mentioned cartoons to a couple weeks ago. Yeah, You like cartoons too? Okay. Well, we watched cartoons, and on one of those cartoons, well, our favorite one was the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour. And, and I think it was Wiley Coyote who tried to make this catapult and pull this tree down and then rope the tree down and lay a big rock on it. And then, and then when the roadrunner would come by, he would cut the rope and the tree would fly up and throw the rock over on the roadrunner. But that never happened. Wiley would always get caught in that. Well, Jack Allen and I decided... We're going, to do, we're going to do that. Now, Jack Allen could climb anything. He could climb a telephone pole, I believe. But he climbed up in this. We had rope with us. I, we found a big flat rock. And Jack Allen climbed up the tree, the biggest tree he could find, that he could make sway back and forth. And so he climbed up in the top of that. Listen, let me stop right there. Do not try this yourselves, please. Okay. Do not try this yourselves. No, don't do it, Sylvia, please don't. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. 
So we, he gets that tree moving back and forth and back and forth, and I grab a hold of a limb, and I'm able to pull it down and get to start tying the rope on it. And I've got the rope tied to the top of the tree, and Jack Allen's tying the rope to the bottom of another tree, and I pick up that big rock, and I lay it on top of that tree just right, and I say, okay. When I said okay, Jack Allen thought that I meant for him to cut the rope. No, I was just saying, okay, I've got the rock on the tree. It wasn't time to cut the rope. But Jack Allen cut the rope. The rock fell off the tree, and the tree sprung up and hit me right across the forehead. And I went head over heels back into the woods. And kind of dazed me a little bit, and I stood up, and, and Jack said, oh, no. I said, what? He said, your head, you've got this huge knot on your head. And I reached up there, and it was, it was like a chicken had laid an egg on my forehead. It was awful. I got scared. Jack started crying. And so I ran out of the woods and ran up to the house, and, and Dad was walking down the driveway, and he said, what happened to you, son? And I said, I got hit in the head with a tree. And he said, well, go on in and tell your mother, and, and she knows what to do. So I went in, and my mother saw me, and I, I can hear her voice today. She said, well, I hold my hand to my Lord. And she took me in, and she's halfway fussing at me and halfway worried about me, put me on the couch, put ice on my forehead, and, well, it, the knot reduced, and, well, you can tell I'm okay now. Well, I'm not sure what kind of internal damage it did, but I'm a, my, my forehead looks good. Dad didn't know what to do, but Mom did. Today, there's a story in the Bible about a man named Bartimaeus. Can you say that? Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus? Yeah, you do good. That's good. And Bartimaeus, something happened to him when he was younger and caused him to be unable to see. And so he had to beg because he couldn't see to work. He couldn't see to make a living. And he heard Jesus was leaving town, and he heard the noise of Jesus and the people and the disciples, people talking and all that sort of thing. And he started yelling for Jesus. Well, Jesus heard him. And just like my mom knew what to do, Jesus knew what to do. And Jesus said, bring him over here. And so they took Bartimaeus over to Jesus. And Jesus said, Bartimaeus, what, what can I do for you? I think Jesus probably knew exactly what Bartimaeus wanted. He wanted to be able to see again. And so Bartimaeus said, Lord, I'd love to be able to see again. And because of Bartimaeus believing in, believing in God, believing in Jesus Christ, his faith in Jesus, he could see again. Immediately he could see again. And you know what he did? He started following Jesus wherever Jesus went. Well, it's a good story. It's really a good story. And it's a better story than trying to shoot rocks with trees. Do not try that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good, Sylvia. Good job. No, you don't want a big knot on your forehead. No, you don't. You surely don't. It's so good to see you all today. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can make a promise. It's Pastor Steve. Come on. <laughs> Carolyn's, Carolyn's picking at me. Let's have a prayer, you all. Oh, God, I am so thankful for these little people that are with me. The joy that bring. The, 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 their beauty, their innocence, they, they teach us exactly who the people are that we all should be. Protect them, O oh Lord. Hold them beneath your wing. 
Keep them safe. Keep them happy, O oh Lord. And help them to know that not only do their family and their church family love them, but you love them always, always. Amen. All right, guys. You ready for some children's church? Are you? Okay. Okay. You want to hang out with me? No, Let's prepare ourselves for a moment of prayer as we sing, Lead Me, Lord. Please respond with a bold print. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of all people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon the labors of all and for the right use of the riches of creation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this community, for those who are present and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and may show your glory in all that we do, we pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who grieve, let faith in Christ, resurrection, and the promise of rest in that place where there is no pain or tears, but life eternal may bring them peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save. Pity and defend us, O God, by your grace. In the communion of the Holy Spirit and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Into traffic court, a woman was brought before the judge to answer for a ticket given to her for running a red light. And she tried to explain to the judge that she was a school teacher. And she requested an immediate dismissal of her case so she could get to school on time. And little by little, the judge began grinning from ear to ear. And he said, so, you're a school teacher. Well, ma'am, I finally get to realize one of my lifelong dreams. I've waited years to have a school teacher in my court. 
Now, sit down at that table and write, I will not run red lights 500 times. That story doesn't really reveal the satisfaction, maybe even the judge's revenge, unless you spent time writing sentences as punishment when you were in school. I'm sure none of you all had to do that. For me, that story, along with today's scripture, makes me wonder, is there something in your life that you've always wanted but still haven't realized yet? Do you have some unfulfilled dream or wish? Or is there a need in your life for which you have no hope? some longing that you've never acted upon. Bartimaeus, the character in the gospel for today, certainly did. Bartimaeus wanted to sight back. Rabbi, I want to see again. Such a plain request. Such a clear and simple desire. It was the desire that drove Bartimaeus' life, the focus of his entire being was to have his sight return. Apparently, once upon a time, he could see, but blindness had occurred either from an accident or an illness, and his life and livelihood had been stolen from him. And the only way he could survive was to sit at the gate in Jericho and beg. But one day, his life changes, and he experiences Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. How? Because he had faith enough to ask, faith enough to believe, and and faith enough to follow. Some of the people in the crowd thought Bartimaeus was rather forward and hollering and trying to get Jesus' attention. They didn't approve of his aggressive behavior or attitude, but his forwardness gave him the faith to ask. But sometimes that's what we need to do. Have you ever wanted or needed something but didn't ask for it, maybe because you just couldn't see how it could ever happen? Too embarrassed to ask? Afraid that others might talk about you or think you to be weak or irresponsible? Maybe you don't like for others to be bothering you all the time and you're sure others don't want to be bothered by you. Bartimaeus, the blind beggar who sat by the roadside. At one time, his life was full of light, and we might imagine his life full of hope, but then something happened to him. He ended up being unable to see. And being sightless, his options in life collapsed. They disappeared, and he ended up a beggar, a bum, and homeless, an unpleasant presence sitting by the roadside. Hoping, hoping that someone would help him, hoping that someone would fill his bowl with food or offer him some money to buy the things that everyone needs. You know, life was extremely difficult and hard for Bartimaeus. There was virtually no compassion in his day for those who were blind. In some circles, it was assumed that their blindness was their own fault that somehow they deserve to be blind because of something they or even their parents had done. In other groups, the fact that you were blind meant simply that you were a drain on resources, a, a social liability, best ignored, best left by the roadside begging. Because Bartimaeus was blind, he was, in many people's eyes, less than human. 
He was an object of shame or cursed or ignored. Hmm. I, I wonder how many of us feel as Bartimaeus must have felt. How many of us feel cut off, alone, neglected, forgotten in the darkness, prevented by one reason or another from fully participating in the life that goes on around us, unable to exercise the options that everyone else seems to have, hurting and alone, disadvantaged, wondering and suspicioning what we've done to deserve this feeling of abandonment. How many of us feel trapped in the life we have, in the job we have, in the relationships we have, in the body we have, unable to break free, unable to change things, powerless to do anything but dream of how it used to be or dream of how it should be? And how many of us being in that position do anything about it? How many reach out for help? How many of us reach out to our friends and neighbors and confide in them our feelings or our needs? How many of us actually ask our family for help when we need it? How many of us dare imagine reaching out to God and ask for God's help? Sometimes we suffer long and hard not because the situation cannot be overcome, but that our independence and pride is so important to us that we don't ask for help. We don't want to burden others, or perhaps we don't want to seem weak to others, or to even to our own selves. A woman who will not pray to God for herself because she thinks God has more important things to do than to listen to her. Or a man who, not, who will not tell his wife how much he is hurting inside because he doesn't think she'll be interested when she has so many troubles of her own to bear. There are those who will not ask for help with their substance abuse, abuse problems because they can't admit to themselves that their problems have become bigger than they are or children and youth who are having a hard time coping with life, who, who will not ask their parents or their teachers for help because they are afraid that they will get into trouble or even worse, be ignored or talked down to and made to feel stupid if they do ask for help. There are those who are breathlessly running from their reality or they're stuck and mired in their problems and troubles. It's a fact. Everyone needs help sometimes. We need help sometimes if we are to survive, if we are to live, and if we are to grow. Sometimes we are so protective of our independence and self-reliance that we fail to turn in different directions and ask God for help. Why is it that we continue to do the same things day after day, hour after hour, and for some unexplainable reason think things will be different? Well, Bartimaeus forgot his pride realized his need and called out to the one who could change his reality and put his faith in motion. You see, God's love is consistent. God always loves us, no matter what. God is ever more willing than we are to ask, and all we need is to allow our, life to, our, our faith to come to life. Bartimaeus had enough to believe that Jesus could and would heal him and restore his sight. A 
Fred Craddock told the story of serving as chaplain at a small 30-bed hospital. And during one of his on-call shifts, a baby was born. And he went to the nursery and discovered a whole family of folks gathered around the window of the nursery looking at the baby. And Fred met the father who looked sort of worried and anxious and dumbstruck all at the same time. I think some of you probably know that new father look. And the baby's name was Elizabeth. And as they looked at the baby, she started to squirm and scream. And the father looked worried. So Fred Craddock said something about the baby not being sick. She's just clearing out her lungs like all newborns do. And the father said, oh, I know she's not sick. But she's mad as a devil. And that took Craddock back a little and asked, why is she mad? And the father said, well, wouldn't you be mad? One minute you're with God in heaven and the next minute you're in Georgia? (laughs) Dr. Craddock asked, you believe she was with God before she she came here? And the father said, oh, yeah. And then Craddock said, do you think she'll remember And he said, well, that's up to her mother and me. That's up to our church. We've got to see that she remembers, because if she forgets, she's a goner. Bartimaeus never forgot whose he was and where he came from. Everyone else around him might have forgotten and treated him like an outcast, but he knew he still belonged to God. He remembered. Don't you ever forget that you belong to God. Jesus promised, I will not leave you orphan. God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are called to remember whose we are and have faith enough to believe. So many of the healing stories end with the person return, the person healed returning to live a normal life, and that's not a bad thing. But Bartimaeus was so moved that he immediately chose to be a follower. He was fast to follow. He didn't hesitate at all. He saw the light. He felt the faith and fast-forwarded his faith to become a follower of Jesus. Pastor Bill Albright tells a story about Bill and Jill They were a young couple who lived down the street from from any of us. And Jill's whole family was active in the church, and Bill hadn't grown up in the church, wasn't real excited about coming to church, and only came because Jill wanted him to, and he complained all the way home, and he certainly never joined the church. He'd rather be fishing or hunting, and most Sundays he was. And Bill had talked with the pastor on numerous occasions. They'd even gone fishing together a couple of times and had long talks about faith and beliefs. The pastor could tell Bill was becoming sort of interested because of the friendship that had developed between the two of them. It happened that the church was about to celebrate its 110th anniversary and the church family was planning a big big shindig they even invited back a retired pastor who had been the pastor there 50 years before 
He preached at the homecoming service. The church, even the pastor, have never heard a sermon like that before. The place was packed. And before he began, the old pastor told the congregation that he had been wrestling with God over what to preach. And then he pulled out his sermon notes and tore them up and told the congregation that God had instructed him to preach from his heart. And that was about 1130 And his sermon was so moving and so engaging that no one noticed the time. And it was 1245 when he gave an invitation for everyone who wanted to rededicate their lives or to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior to stand. And the pastor had been watching the congregation and had seen how everyone was so totally focused. Everyone felt God's presence, but none more so than Bill. He leaped up like he was in a race to come forward, but then this retired minister did something different. He told the congregation that because he had preached so long, he wasn't going to give an altar call that day. Instead, he wanted them all to come back next Sunday and for the pastor to give the altar. And all week long, the pastor tried to get with Bill to see what was going on and maybe give a little guidance or advice, but the pastor never caught him at home. But next Sunday, when the pastor finished his sermon, he gave that altar call. And you would have thought that Bill had coil springs in his shoes or that the church had some of those new rumble pews because the pastor no sooner started to give the call than Bill was on his way down the aisle. And the surprising thing was that no one else came at first. Bill fell on his knees and said in a loud, joyous voice and tears in his eyes, I want Jesus as my Savior, and I want to live a life worthy of him. Will you let me? Will you baptize me? Pastor, will you let me know? The pastor couldn't have stopped him if he had tried. And about that time, everyone else started coming down, either to rededicate themselves or to accept Jesus for the first time. The pastor baptized Bill and a couple others that day. And the whole congregation saw Bill's faith. The whole congregation saw Bill's faith that day because... Like Bartimaeus, he had faith enough to follow Jesus. How about you? Is there something in your life that you've always wanted but still haven't realized yet? Do you have some unfulfilled dream or wish is there a need in your life for which you have no hope? Some longing that, that you've never acted upon? Where is the blindness in your life? Call out to Jesus. Jesus, Messiah, Beloved Son of God, have mercy on me. Take your faith out and do something with it. Faith enough to ask, faith enough to believe, and faith enough to follow. Amen. Our closing hymn of commitment today is number 139. As we sing to the as we sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. You're welcome to stand as we sing.
Thank you so much for being here today. Your presence means everything to Sunday worship, and we're so thankful that you're here. Don't forget, no bluegrass picking this afternoon. Please tell those folks that you run into that we've postponed it. It probably will be next Sunday. I'll let you know as soon as I know for sure. And hope to see uh, the trustees and also church council this coming Wednesday at 6 and 7. Receive these words of benediction. Go forth into God's world as God's own children. Let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and your deeds. Go with joy to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.